All right, good morning, everyone. This is a joint meeting of Senate Health and Welfare and House Health Care. I'm Senator Ginny Lyons, Chair of uh, Senate Health Care, Health and Welfare. And Bill, um, good go morning, ahead. Uh, Bill Lippert, uh, Representative Bill Lippert, uh, Chair of the House Health Care Committee. So this this Join morning we're uh, this morning we're very uh, pleased to have with us um, Susanna Davis and others who have completed work on our uh, report, our diversity report in healthcare. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking before we jump right into uh, hearing from you, Susanna, and the other folks with you and ask you uh, how will you how will you uh, go through the testimony are you going to share the testimony or do you want to go in order thank you good morning i had hoped just to speak very very briefly and then turn it over to andlea and mark to add um in fill in any gaps that i may have missed so that sounds a perfect i uh, just to just as an fyi for you folks um Senate Health and Welfare will need to leave at 10 o'clock. And uh, if the House Health Care has additional questions, they may be able to sort that out until about 10.15. We do have a joint meeting on the floor of, uh, at, at 10.30. So just, just some timing issues and we'll try to keep, it, um, keep you informed as we go along. Okay, so... Um, Please introduce yourself for the record, and we're, we're very happy that you're here and look forward to the report. Thank you. For the record, Susanna Davis, Executive Director of Racial Equity for the State of Vermont. I have six slides for you, so I hope I can get through them quickly. And I just want to confirm if I can share those or if I should ask the- Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay. Can. Great. Well, there's can and can, right? We'll see if this works. <laughs> Let's see. Turn it up just a little bit. All right, you should be able to see my screen. Yes. Great. Okay. So I'm going to ask if you're not speaking uh, to maybe mute yourself. I, I think the committee room is coming through. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I can press that. This is the logistics of hybrid. Okay, Susanna, sorry for the interruption. Why don't you go ahead? All right, thank you. So I can only see one of you, so please do feel free to stop me with any uh, questions or if you need me to repeat something. So we are here today to discuss the Health Equity Advisory Commission, and I might refer to that as the HEAC here to fourth. Um, the HEAC's report, it is the first report which was originally due to be filed on January 15th of this year. Uh, the committees were gracious enough to give the commission a bit of an extension, and I'm going to discuss why that was requested and what it meant for us. So first I will begin by um, giving you a little bit of background about how this committee, uh, this commission has been set up. So it is a whopping 29 members large and includes representatives from state agencies, including the Department of Disability, Aging and Independent Living, DCF, that's Department of Children and Families. It includes representatives from agency of administration, of course, that's Racial Equity Office. It also includes community partners and not-for-profits um, and community organizations, including the NAACP, the Racial Justice Alliance, Outright Vermont, um, the Commission on Native American Affairs, plus representatives from each of the state recognized Abenaki bands. It's a very large group and we are extremely fortunate to have that breadth of expertise in the room. So with a large scope and with a large group, one of the early decisions that we made was to break our work down into seven main components and to create subcommittees aligned with those components. You'll see those described on the screen. Our subcommittee structure allows us to be able to take smaller bites. This is a very large um, sector of work that we're looking at. There are people who spend entire careers working full-time and around the clock 
to be able to figure out and think through some of the things that we're asked to think through here. So you'll see that these committees range from access to care to policy, training, external engagement, data, upstream factors, grants, et cetera. This covers a lot of the tangible duties that we as a commission are asked to perform, such as the distribution of grant funding, and also covers some of the more theoretical and uh, policy related matters, such as upstream factors and social determinants of health, which are gonna lead us to topics that may not sit directly with health or the medical, the healthcare delivery system, but which certainly have impacts on individual and public health. So the commission is at a point right now where we are still standing up these subgroups. Um, but before we got started on the subgroups, we did have a number of discussions as a larger group where we figured out, hey, you know what, this is a really big scope and we wanna make sure that we do this correctly. In the room, you have people who are in high, high ranking roles of government, people who are in um, supervisory or managerial positions, people who are advocates. Some of us are invited into many spaces and others of us struggle to bring our folding chair to the table, so to speak. And so with that, wide of an experience, um, we wanted to make sure that we did some level setting and try to model process equity as much as we could. Now, we're not there yet. It's certainly not perfect, and we're still having ongoing discussions about how we can make our group and its experience more equitable. But some of the things that we have agreed on and landed on early include things like accessibility policy for our meetings. It includes things like making sure that our documents are formatted in a way that is accessible for people who may be visually impaired. It means that we have um, a team of people who are dedicated to engagement and communication should we receive inquiries from members of the public, members of the press, members of government, et cetera. All of these things contribute to a broader goal of process equity. It's not just about making sure that we arrive at the correct conclusions but about making sure that we didn't step on anyone while we got there. Now, the way that you go about it is one thing, but what we have to work with and what we have to talk about is quite another. One of the earliest findings that we, came, that we arrived at was about data. We hear the same story in every sector imaginable, especially when it comes to equity. We have some data, it's not great. We need more data, it has to be better. We've got to collect it better, more consistently. We need the technology. All of these things are true in the health equity space as well. And in addition to those things, here are a few other challenges that have made our data situation a little bit more fraught. We know that historically, and this is centuries and centuries, medical research has tended to focus on people in dominant groups. A lot of what we know about health and medicine is because of work that has been done that centers able-bodied people, male-identified people, and people of European descent. What that means is, and I'll give you one example, um, and I think this example might even be in the report. It's, if you ask somebody, what are the signs of a heart attack in progress? They might tell you, oh, left arm situation and whatever else. As a matter of fact, that is a symptom, that is a sign that is common in men, but not in women having a heart attack. But many people don't know that. The fact is a lot of what we know or what we think we know about health and medicine centers people who have historically been in positions of power. Here's another example. Early on during COVID-19, we were looking for symptoms and telling people what was the short list of things to look out for. One of those things that we said to look out for was if you see discoloration around the lips, maybe if your lips are looking blue. Well, if you're a dark skinned person, your lips may not appear blue. And if the guidance that we're putting out tends to center people with light colored skin, then well, we're effectively excluding other people from being able to timely detect um, things like COVID-19 symptoms. So we know that medical research has tended to focus on able-bodied, male identified and European descended people. And we also know that a lot of the more painful medical research has been done on, well, everybody else. Think of the more harrowing experiments that have happened over the years. We always talk about Tuskegee, but there's so much more, unfortunately, that's been inflicted on our community. We know that, for example, J. Marion Sims, who's regarded as the so-called father of gynecology, did a lot of his work on um, black and brown women 
and it was grossly painful, often without any sort of anesthesia. Of course, no crediting or further assistance to the families or to the patients. We know that the experience of people like Henrietta Lacks, which touches on issues not just of medical ethics, but also things like intellectual property and um, you know, ethics in the way that we communicate about diseases. We know that in Vermont, we have a deep and extremely disturbing history of eugenics. And what's important to note here is we often talk about eugenics in Vermont as being directed at indigenous people, and that is very much true. But it also had an incredibly deep impact on the community of people living with disabilities who were also a major target. As a result, when we talk about things like trust, and I'll come back to trust in a moment, when we talk about things like trust, People living with disabilities, people who are indigenous, and really the rest of us, all have the memory that is longer than our lifetime, right? The intergenerational trauma that these things have brought. I'll continue. We know that in the United States, um, women have been sterilized in carceral facilities as conditions of release. As recently as two years ago or last year at the southern border, involuntary hysterectomy of migrant people. We know that on Puerto Rico, we were also, well, the United States was also sterilizing a lot of women. So when we think about the need for collecting data, so much of data requires the participation of individuals in the public. Collecting data about me requires some level of my participation. Although the way the police state of the United States is shaping up, soon you won't even need me to participate. You'll have everything you need. Regardless, where we are right now, You've got to have some level of participation from the individual, him, her, or themselves. However, because of the history of medical research and experimentation, those of us who come from historically marginalized populations tend not to have that trust in government or in public health. Now, we also know in terms of data needs and availability that the technology we use to collect, aggregate, and report those data also makes it difficult to do certain things like add categories. For example, we know that for a long time, the state has been having conversations about adding a third gender category for things like um, unemployment or driver license or birth certificate. And sometimes it's a matter of policy, whether people are willing to do it, but sometimes it's a matter of technology. The system will not let us put another letter that's not F or M. And it's a bizarre and strange thing that we're still having to overcome those hurdles, but that is some, some of the challenge. We also know that antiquated technology makes it harder for us to share across agencies. And that also leads us to another related issue, which is personally identifying information and small sample size. That uh, creates challenges with statistical weighting, which in the long run also helps, uh, hinders our ability to understand the full picture of what's happening. So that's a little bit on data. What you're looking at now is a screen that is extremely overwhelming, and that is a little bit on purpose. When we were, as a commission, working through some of the issues um, that we wanted to discuss in our first report, and really trying to understand the full scope and breadth of this work, it became extremely clear that it was a lot. It was a whole lot, and again, going back to the point that we wanted to do this right, meant that we were very intentional about wanting to take our time. Now, of course, we respect the, the legislature and specifically that these committees have carefully and meticulously put together timelines that could assist them in policy making and budgeting. And we certainly don't wanna step on that, but more importantly, we also don't wanna step on the decades of advocacy work and policy work that has been done on these issues for years. And so what you are looking at now is the product of some of those brainstorming and issue mapping conversations where we said, okay, what are some of the things that we wanna be able to uplift in this work and in the next few phases of our work? And so that includes things like addressing the issues of trust and intergenerational trauma. It includes things like compensating people for their labor when we bring them in to tell us about their experiences or to help us think through good policy. Acknowledging history and incorporating traditional healing. Process equity, accessibility, staffing and timelines and training, because we know as a commission, we can come up with great ideas for policy, but are they going to be supported with the appropriate resources and given the time they need? We know that stakeholders in this work are gonna include leaders and experts in transportation and housing and education, right? The upstream and social determinants. 
we felt strongly that we did not want to pit any groups of focus against one another, whether it was a community of people living with disabilities, the LGBTQIA plus population, people of color. We felt that yes, we are all historically marginalized groups and have had varying degrees of problems with public health and with government. However, um, we felt strongly that it was a yes and, and wanted to make sure that we were moving everybody forward together. We talked about um, whether data include self-identified information or perceived information. For example, if I go to a doctor's appointment and they code me as an African-American person, they would have coded me incorrectly. Are our data accurate based on how people self-identify? And how are we accounting for the increased number of mixed race people whose identities may not be as easy to spot from the outside? We talked about access to care, particularly for people who may use medical assistive devices. Um, are there Hoyer lifts in dentist offices, et cetera? We talked about access for the trans and gender non-conforming population um, and how people's personal views and social views impact whether or not they are provided appropriate care. We talked about language barriers, age discrimination for youth and for older adults. We talked about some of the ways in which the work is siloed, for example, schools. And schools, really, that's multifaceted. One is the way that we teach health education in schools. And the other fork in that bifurcation is the way that we provide health in schools. For example, we have members of the commission who work as school uh, health personnel, and they have shared that they are largely restricted just to acute care in schools. There is not really a mechanism for a more holistic and a more long-term solution for health in schools. Silos also exist with insurers, regulators, and providers, particularly when you consider the stratified federal and state um, issues around health. Of course, the carceral system is another area in which the uh, work is very siloed. And I have to add that in the United States, because of course the United States, the name of the game here is mass incarceration. What we have now is not only a bursting prison population, but also an aging one. And so around the country now, we are having to retrofit carceral facilities to accommodate the, the older population of people who are incarcerated. And as we think about things like changing uh, legalities, and you know, I'm thinking about like the cannabis market and how many people have aged in place in jail around the country for something that now suddenly we're turning around and saying, oops, should have never been illegal. Let's figure out a way that we can make, help people make money from it. Well, let's also consider the health impact of those who had been harmed and incarcerated for it. And at the way bottom right there, you'll see a tiny one that says so many committees. Um, and that's a big one because while it's really great that we as a state put attention on a lot of issues, it's also important that we make sure that the work is as streamlined as possible. Can we accomplish in one group what we set up three groups to do? Are those three groups talking to each other? Is it an appropriate use of resourcing? And are we really getting a broad set of perspectives from all of them? So these are just some of the many issues that we were able to identify. I'm gonna pull one quote from the report um, that I thought really highlighted this, this issue of pacing and timing, which says, because of the breadth and depth of these topics, the commission has chosen to perform its work at a pace that allows for thorough research and meaningful community input. I stress that this was very important to the group, even with 29 of us who represent the black and Latino and Asian and indigenous and LGBTQIA plus population and people living with disabilities and people experiencing socioeconomic disparity and people who may be limited English proficient, even with all of us together as 29 people, we still do not represent the entirety of the statewide constituency who we need to be thinking about. And so we're, we're committed to doing this right, and that means both internal and outward facing protocols. So that's pretty much where we are. And I will just add that the, uh, of course, here are links to the report. We will add that there is a plain language summary and also an audio reading of plain language summary. Again, these are some of the measures that we uh, wanted to take to make sure that the report and our work were as accessible as possible. Um, so just to look a little bit ahead on the horizon, some of the work that we intend to do 
going forward is going to be hearing more from providers. And everyone has a different idea of what the word provider means. Um, I suppose as I use it here, we're thinking of, yes, major hospital networks and um, policy people in healthcare delivery, but absolutely from people who are doing the work. We want to hear more from nurses. We want to hear more from EMTs. We want to hear more from crisis prevention workers and crisis intervention workers, I should say, um, and everybody in between. We also want to look more closely at what data are available, what data are missing, and how we can bridge that gap, and what's it going to take funding-wise to be, to be able to bridge that gap. It's also important that we understand the demographic landscape of the state. Now that we have 2020 census figures, um, we can sort of keep looking ahead at who, this, who is going to be more reflective of the statewide population and being able to prepare for that. Another big thing here is being trauma responsive. For example, it's great that we're in, um, looking to have uh, more people coming in under the refugee program. That is something that I am particularly ex excited about, but it's no use bringing people here who are already coming from a background of deep trauma if we're not going to protect them and care for them while they're here. And so looking at it from a multidisciplinary perspective to make sure that we're including not just health-related people, but everyone who is playing a role here. So uh, I'll pause it there, grateful for your time. And I would ask, um, of course, I'm available for any questions you may have, but also want to leave enough space for Mark and Andrea. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, that was very helpful. And uh, I think it resonates with many of us, the breadth and the depth of the issues that you are approaching are significant. And so I will, I'll just ask one question and then I think we probably should just keep going and listening. But as you're looking for data and information, it seems that if you're using the typical research bases that we currently have, there may or may not be supporting information for the work that you're doing. And um, so just as an observation, but what, what research uh, databases have you utilized in as you've gone through the reporting work? Thank you for your comment, actually, because that it does speak to another issue that um, I know we had this conversation a, a couple of weeks ago. Mark was present for that, where he um, astutely pointed out that a lot of the data we have exists were collected within a system that in itself is systemically biased and systemically racist. And so even the being able not just to trust the numbers, but being able to trust the ways in which we collected it and the ways in which we're storing and grouping it is, is important too. Um, and so we're, we're all swimming in that same water. But to answer your question specifically, some of the databases that we use include the national data. Of course, we're pulling from federal work. And I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm showing here how much of a data nerd I am not because <laughs> there okay. are some some people on the commission are much better uh, positioned to be able to explain that more clearly. But I will say that we have um, definitely a few people on the commission who are expert researchers um, who probably would be better at answering that question than I am. I will say, though, that um, we do have access to some of the more um, so some of the databases where access is limited because we have state people who have access to certain, you know, whatever it is, government data or healthcare system data. And that has been helpful, but we also don't want to rely on things that the public doesn't have access to either. So we're trying to, I think, use a good mix of qualitative data, quantitative data, and data that may not be publicly accessible right now, but that we can help make publicly accessible within, of course, applicable regulations. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, I might link up with you again going forward, and uh, we can maybe talk about this a little bit within our committee um, with you. It, we're, 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 getting, we're bumping up on crossover, so it may not be right away, but uh, I think it's something that, that is important. So thank you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll let you go ahead. You have the floor, Susanna. All right. Um, so I see Andrea has, has come off mute. 
I'm gonna take that as readiness. Yes, please. Thank you. Kwekwai Hirombak, Uli Giskat, Uli Pumkeni. So I'm, uh, that is hello friends and good morning. Um, I am a native Vermonter. I represent the Kawasuk tri uh, band. Thank you, um, Susanna, for saying that correctly. And all of this as a fellow commission member, um, I represent Kawasuk and I also keep, try to keep the lens that it's all Vermonters, all indigenous folks living in Vermont from that perspective. And we, as Susanna did talk about the trust, we are in the middle of Black slash African American History Month. And the theme this year is Black health and wellness. And so as we are also looking, as I'm looking at that in this lens for my testimony to you today is we are looking, as Susanna said, hearing from providers, um, can we think about outside of the box for between um, not just Western medicine and other ways of knowing? Um, and so we, and looking at that data, how are we going to get that data? How are we going to have that trust? Um, because I, what I'm hearing from Kawasak and other indigenous folks, other Abenaki in Vermont, uh, and as Susanna pointed out, I present to my healthcare provider as white seeming. And when, even though I've put on the paperwork, I'm Abenaki and that is, um, and then depending on who I have for a provider, I just recently had an, uh, an interaction that I left feeling that they thought I was quote unquote crazy. And so I, it, the, these are the things that as I'm sitting on the commission that for my hat that I'm also thinking of for the community to make sure that we are being inclusive and representative of everyone in the state um, for uh, birth doulas, midwives, and not just within a medical facility like the hospital offering midwives because it's still in a facility that looks like a medical model. Um, I had my children at home uh, with a team of midwives, um, women of color. And so I, I think about those things. So as, we're as we are talking about this health equity um, access, uh, and I also within my work, because I do work um, in case management at the hospital for folks who are un and underinsured Vermonters. And I hear so many of these stories. Um, so I'll leave it there. I don't want to belabor everybody. And hello, Ginny. <laughs> hello, Andrea. It's good to hear your voice, even though I can't see you. <laughs> uh, yes, my camera seems to be broken. I'm working oh, nuts. on that. OK, yes. well, yes. <laughs> but uh, Andrea, thank you for your work on this. I, and um, I, I know that you have a long history of working on this and we're, we're very appreciative of your um, helping the state resolve some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susanna then is, is Mark Cues next on the list? Do, does anyone, I guess the, a, a quick question then for Andrea. You know, I, I know that there are folks, for example, who work in uh, the medical community with uh, indigenous folks. And uh, in, in fact, my husband worked with some of the indigenous people in Alaska for, for a few years. And so I'm just, there must be some data out there that helps with the, med the medical uh, treatment for individuals from various uh, tribal backgrounds or ethnic uh, backgrounds that you've identified in the process? Has that there are, there are, and um, the, there are a lot of that data, like you said, are, is indigenous, not indigenous necessarily to Vermont, to Abenaki. Um, and so, and Dr. Avila has uh, provided data uh, for various reports, um, not for our necessarily for our commission, but I'm aware of her, the data that she has available. Um, and so uh, 
I believe that some of that is has been being used and is being used as far as the medical setting goes. Um, also working for the hospital in that I see um, this is something that they are working on for DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion for whether it's onboarding the medical students, the residents, whether it will be ongoing training for cultural competency, cultural humility, that type of thing for uh, providers, managers. They, it's, it's seen, you know, so as I come from that in that lens here in this world, and again, with the commission work and my being uh, an Abenaki Vermonter and representing Kawasuk, I um, trying to balance that to make sure. And then the question that I've had is, is, is the state expecting our commission to be the final content experts on these topics? When as a commission, we are saying, well, let's slow down. Let's make sure we have these necessary voices at the table, like Susanna said, the folding chair. Um, and not necessarily, I, even though I represent Kawasuk, I do want to make sure that we have the necessary voices, that we're hearing them and we're hearing their concerns, their ideas, uh, and not just moving forward with the sort of that patriarchal model still of being the experts and we know best for everybody else. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, this is very helpful and I greatly appreciate it because it helps to explain how the commission is working and the steps that you're taking to be, to clarify, uh, it is very helpful. In some ways it sounds very much like the scientific process, but in other ways it, uh, it allows for some social and cultural uh, interaction. This, this is really very helpful to all of us. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I feel like we can't leave out the social and cultural aspects of health because as Susanna mentioned with the report, there is the historical uh, trauma and so on and so forth. And folks are bringing that to the table as well. Not only are in the individual members of the commission, the folks that we are thinking about for how this will impact for the health and equity for the state and how it is implemented in policy and legislation and everything. Well, we, we actually look forward to receiving recommendations from you folks. And so, so for some of us, there's a little bit of disappointment that we don't have those in our hands, but this really helps us to understand the thoroughness with which you all are working and greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and I do have a, another meeting that I have to jump to. If will I, Do you think I'll still be needed or will it be okay for me to jump off? I think that's up to Susanna. I think that this is helpful to have heard your comments. Thank you, Andrea. I think uh, if there's any other follow-up, I'm happy to, to connect with you offline, but thank you for being here. Thank you. Adios. Adios. Mark, I see you off mute. Good morning, I'm Reverend Mark Hughes. I am the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and Justice for All. I am also the principal of the Racial Equity Association and LLC and the head of a uh, community center here known as the Richard Kemp Center, which is a cultural empowerment center here in, in, uh, in Burlington. Mark, Mark, can I ask for you yeah. to perhaps speak a little closer to your mic? Yeah. While, while I do that, how about if I go towards towards my system preferences and um, and look for volume because that's every now and then it sneaks away from me. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, that would be great. great. Let me see. Was in the room as well. Thank you. See if I can uh, work on that. Boy, this is exciting. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. That's much better, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Everybody Perfect. just go like this. Yeah, thank you. 
So again, and for the record, again, I'm, I'm Reverend Mark Hughes. I'm the executive director of Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, also Justice for All, and an LLC called the Racial Equity Association. Um, the Richard Kemp Center, which, which is here in, in Burlington, and also a minister at the New Alpha Missionary Baptist Church here, uh, the only uh, church in Vermont that worships in the African-American tradition. Uh, so thank you for having me, and, and it's been a pleasure serving with the, um, with the uh, commission. Um, it's uh, interesting being a commissioner, being like I, now I'm a commissioner again. I was a, I was a commissioner with the police here and in Burlington. Now I'm a commissioner again. I just thought about that this morning. Uh, so it's really good to see uh, many of your faces, which I recognize and I'm normally walking by you in the hallways in the state house. I uh, just wanted to, uh, you know, just uh, give a shout out to Madam Chair and, and Mr. Chair over in the house as well. And thank you all for the work that y'all did on what was H210. Our H210 was enacted as Act 33. And we were happy to be able to bring this uh, work forward, this uh, racial equity work forward. Obviously we've segmented it in a way where we've envisioned it as work that was related to racial equity, but we put it forward in a way in acknowledging equity across all spectrums. Obviously, we do the work in racial equity. Um, this is a part of a much larger uh, strategy. And so um, you, what I'd like to do is, is just, just for a couple of minutes, explain to you part of that and talk a little bit more also about where, you know, where we are in this process with the HEAC, more importantly. Um, what I will say is, is, is you know, it was our strategy to, uh, to continue to work of um, community engagement and support. Uh, there's a lot of activities that we have, which include the work of the, uh, the Kemp Center. And the reason why I'm framing this this way is because there is a lot to do to address equity, not just policy, uh, not just um, commissions. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that, that's happening, as you would know, outside of those commission meetings in, in across our communities and across various organizations across the state. Um, so a lot of work, uh, which includes the work that we're rolling out in the Richard Kemp Center, um, the outreach and education component of the work that we're doing, which augments your R113, which was your racism health, uh, uh, health emergency, public health emergency. Um, the uh, part of that is, is that a seminar we have called, called Turning the Curve. Uh, we, you know, various other um, outreach and education initiatives, uh, abolish slavery. Uh, there's, there's one on uh, reparations in Vermont, the definition of systemic racism and the economics of systemic racism. All of these are ongoing. Um, there is a, um, obviously a component that has to do with uh, in, uh, platforms and initiatives, which leads to our uh, Acknowledge Change and Transform uh, a, a platform here at the state legislature, as well as our moral budget. And what we initiated last year was, is in addition to putting forward PR2, which you just passed over the last couple of weeks with the constitutional amendment. It also involved, obviously, the, as I said, R113, uh, which was, I think, PRH6 last uh, year, the um, racism public health emergency as well as H210, which what we're here to talk about right now, and H406, which is an economic and, and cultural empowerment um, piece that's, that's now over in, um, I believe it's in, um, in fine, no, not finance, but. Um, Ways and means. Uh, somewhere in the house, we'll come yeah. back to that. Commerce, thank commerce. You. Oh, it's commerce. Commerce. Okay. commerce, thank you, thank you, Rep. Tina. So, so the thing is, is that there's a, we've just got a lot of things going on that's directed, you know, currently, you know, with the geopolitical and economic implications of systemic racism, you know, we believe that that's, you know, it's, it's driving, it's driving all things right now. And obviously, you know, we appreciate the consideration that you're given. Uh, to this, and it is an integral component of the conversation that we're having uh, within uh, the committee. So I'll pause there for a minute. Just that was just the framing of how we how we got here and all the other stuff that we're doing as the alliance. I want to talk a little bit more about the HEAC, but I just want to pause and just see if there's any questions that the committee has of me, or if there's anything not just, that I just covered, but also in your limited time that you have left, which is maybe about we're going to call it ten or twelve minutes in your limited time that you have left. If, is there anything that you'd like to hear from me uh, in, in what it is that, you know, I'm going to be presenting here? Because I can just go straight, cut straight to the chase if there's something, Madam Chair, that you'd like to hear. 
I'd like to hear your presentation first, and then uh, there may be a question or two, but you know, go, go right ahead. Thank you. Fantastic. So one of the things that I, I wanted to come and talk about is, is just to kind of echo what Tutana said. And first, you know, just I want to give a shout out to my colleagues, uh, Andrea, Tutana, all of the, the, the stuff that we're doing together is pretty exciting. It's, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a huge challenge. It's a heavy lift. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and it's, it doesn't go uh, without, um, you know, it, it doesn't go without, you know, complications. So uh, the one of the challenges that we're having right now within the committee uh, is, is just coming to terms with the fact that, you know, in addition to all of the other demographics, we also have a demographic called government and non-government. And, and what that means is, is that there is a there is a significant portion of folks within the committee that are government employees, which means they have access uh, to the infrastructure like SharePoint, uh, various other technology assets. They are collaborative by nature. They're at work all of the time. They're always logging in. They're always communicative with one another. And this is most of them. It's not their first rodeo. And many of them, they're senior uh, in the uh, executive uh, administration, which means that a lot sometimes if we're not careful, this thing takes unto itself a life of its own. And what it does is it kind of negates the whole um, uh, equity adventure that we're trying to build uh, within this process. So we've identified that as an issue and and um, and and it's it's unfortunate, but in my opinion, it was, it was post report that we've actually had the conversation on it. Um, Personally, you know, I'm appreciative of the fact that we were able to get get you a, a report, but you know me, I'm fairly candid. I don't I don't think that the report really is it, it it holds a lot of weight in my world because what we were doing is, is we were meeting a deadline. Um, I think the vast majority of the report, personally, it does contain um, a you know a lot of findings, or I, I should say, it came from a conversation uh, that we had uh, prior to. Uh, prior to such time as we were able to um, really dig in, um, you know, we, what we what we were doing was is we were just, we just we just wanted to figure out, you know, what were the issues. So you'll see this thing called issues, um, and you know, even even with that, I don't I don't know that they're comprehensive, and and I don't know that you know we've really had a chance to dig into those, and they take up the vast majority of the report. And even looking through it now, me as being a member, and I'm pretty pretty involved. I I don't. There are things that I really didn't have a chance to even squeeze in there. So there's there's some you know so there's some there's some challenges because it's a real, it's a really fast moving train and and it's it's really uh, difficult and complicated for some folks who are community members to keep up with this process. Um, some of us are just trying to figure out how to log into SharePoint from time to time. So we're but we're we're figuring it out. Is I guess is the good news. We are figuring it out. We we've had the conversation. We'll continue to have the conversation. Um, you know that I think the biggest the the biggest highlight or the biggest takeaway from the report uh, is the word preliminary. It is preliminary. Uh, it's you know it's we are here to report. You know we we have provided a report. I think and from my personal perspective, again, I think it's largely perfunctory. Uh, I don't really, I, you know, I'm not trying to discredit the work of, of my commission because I respect all of my colleagues, but I'm here to tell you, um, you know, from the perspective in which I've been operating in this process, uh, I also sit on the, um, the policy committee, I sit on the data committee, and I also uh, sit on the training committee, uh, subcommittees of this group. Uh, I'm an integral component of what's going on here. I'll, this is very, very important to me. It's very important to the Alliance. It's unfortunate we didn't get across the finish line, the HEAC that we wanted, or that we envisioned, but we're doing the best we can with what we were given. Um, and process is really, really important here. Um, I would also say that there are things that, uh, from your perspective, you know, the way I see this process is, is I, you know, with all due respect, I think there are some things that our legislature, our policymakers, and the exec our executive branch and many others already know we must do. Already know we must do. And, and what I would want to encourage you and just really implore you is, is please don't wait for us. Uh, please don't wait for us to come back. Please don't sit back and wait. And I know you're very busy. I know you got y'all got a, a thousand things going on, different directions. You're sitting on multiple committees in the whole nine yards. Plus you have a life. But please don't wait for us to come back with certain recommendations. For example, we know that there is a huge need for a data infrastructure as we sit on an unprecedented budget surplus. 
as a state. We know that. We understand that this data infrastructure, it must accommodate these, you know, tracking these disparities across various systems. And, and I think it's, at the, it's the heart and soul of everything that we're doing, not just from the racial equity perspective, but from an equity perspective across the board. So please don't wait for that. Uh, please, please make the necessary, the requisite investments in that uh, immediately. Uh, get, let's get the folks, just get a bunch of smart folks in a room and not let them out until they come out with a plan on how we move that forward. Uh, the other thing, uh, it pertains to upstream. There's something that we refer to as upstream. Uh, one of the things that uh, we believe in, you know, I want to just give a shout out to Andrea for acknowledging Black history is, is what we believe at the Racial Just Justice Alliance uh, as it pertains to uh, Black history, well, as it pertains to wellness, we have a wellness working group of which uh, Rep. China is, is a part of, and there are, there are many others who are across the community who are a part of this wellness working group. And it was through this wellness working group that H210 was born. Um, it was through this wellness working group that a, a lot of activities uh, have been happening. And we've discovered that we can't just talk about health because we got this thing called upstream. And here's what we said, and if I don't mind, if you don't mind me quoting this, it says, our wellness is at the epicenter of all we do and experience. We must consider every action taken to dismantle systemic racism as an act of enhancing our wellness. We will disrupt status quo systems and develop long range strategies for black led alternative approaches to create healthy outcomes. We will fight for wellness as if our life depends upon it because they do. So I just wanted to share that with you because that is the perspective that we have. There is a lot of work that's happening in housing in education and employment, workforce development, economic development, transportation, and also the, the criminal justice system across all of these. And we know that we need to be working simultaneously. And this goes back to please do the work now and don't wait for us. It goes back to the fact that we already know that policy and training uh, that in, in ongoing education, we already know that data and the infrastructure required to support it are very important across every single one of those aforementioned areas. So as you go, as you go back to your committees and you focus your time and attention on what it is that's important, understand that it too, they too also come back uh, to our wellness. And finally, I just want to go back to um, this conversation on uh, funding. This bill, um, as represent as Chair Lipper knows, and those in the House know well, the fourth or fifth thing that happened in its um, preparation for crossover is, is that it was stripped of funding, those stripped of money. That doesn't mean if we see today that there is funding required in the initiatives that we are undertaking that this joint committee shouldn't consider moving the, the necessary funding into place so we can do the work more effectively. Since we are in a unprecedented budget surplus and this work is about wellness, not just for racial equity, but for all equity across the entire state and it too is unprecedented. So I thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come before you. It's really good to see uh, some of you and I'll take your questions uh, now if you have any, Madam Chair. Thank you, Reverend Hughes. Um, that was very inspiring to say the least. And we appreciate the time and energy that you and Andrea and Susanna have given to the commission. Um, I do have a couple of questions and I'll start with the budget at the end. So does the commission, did the commission have a budget request, a line item request that perhaps went through the administration into the, into the big bill, into the, the larger budget? That's one. Uh, or do you have such a, a line item request that we could look at? 
I don't want to assume to, uh, anything on answering that question. I'm going to defer to our fearless leader, uh, Susanna okay. Davis, on that one. Okay. Okay. And I'll come back and ask another question, probably for both of you. Madam Chair, can you repeat it one more time so that I can answer you concisely? Sure. It's a, the comment was that the commission really does it doesn't have the funding it needs, and I'm my question is. Did the governor put in his budget any funding request for the commission that, you know, based on your request and whether or not that happened, do you have a, a budget that we could look at, a line item budget for the commission? As a, as a point of clarification before she answers that, um, just, to, just so I can be clear on the record. Sure. Uh, what I was actually stating was is in the event that the commission that the commission does require funding. Got it. Um, we definitely need to know that that's available. And I think okay. that we, we need to be preemptive in that respect, particularly since, particularly since we know that fund, money is available now and work usually doesn't happen free. So I was just making some assumptions. So I don't want that question to go to Susanna uh, with that pretense that somehow or another, there's some um, something that we need Got that it. we have that we spoke about. Thank okay. you. So, okay, but I guess the, the question is, will there be a request? Do you have a, a request? So the, to my knowledge, the, there is no item in the governor's recommended budget for the commission. The commission has the $180,000 allocation that the, this committee put forth last year to support the hiring of a contractor to assist in the work around standing up an office of health, or the recommendations around standing up an office of health equity. It is also from that pool that the commission members per diems are being pulled. So that is an additional draw on that line item as well. What it does not account for also is any other kind of compensation that we may want to provide for people who are not commission members who are performing labor, joining us or doing any other kind of uh, policy insight for us or with us. Um, I can't necessarily foresee any um, space or equipment needs, but again, because we do want to be inclusive and provide physical accommodation, um, that is something to consider as we eventually go back to in-person meetings. Um, those are some of the things that I, I can think about, but again, I think that the commission, I agree with Mark uh, that this first report is not necessarily the, the substantive depth we wanted to get into uh, because we chose to be very intentional and in not wanting to rush something, but still wanting to honor the deadline which, which we were given. But I will say that um, the budget conversations we do intend to have more deeply and more fully and come to you with well laid out recommendations on that when we have been able to give it the, the time and the attention they deserve. Thank you. And that, this actually links with a comment I made earlier about data analysis, collection and analysis, and maybe hopefully during one of our committee meetings after crossover, we can get back and, and look at this a little bit together. Um, I, I won't ask my next question. My, my other question and something you can probably think about is how do you balance all the issues and needs that you have in your commission? And then there are bills, as you said, Reverend Hughes, there are bills that are uh, in, in the legislature now or will be put in. And we don't want to be business as usual and go catch as catch can. But on the other hand, the commission may wish to support some of these bills. So it would be helpful to know going forward which legislation would be important to the commission as a whole. So just those two things to think about. Representative China and then Senator Hardy. Thank you. Um... I, I want to start by saying that I'm actually not disappointed with the presentation today um, because when we created this commission, we the intent was for this commission to have greater autonomy than past groups, um, and we acknowledged how you know how if we're going to change structural oppression, we need to empower people to do things differently. So for you to come to us and and be and and give honest feedback that your assessment is that the amount of work is so monumental that it's going to take more time. And the way you've sorted it to me, it all makes sense. And I appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I think we, we, we can be patient and give the group 
time and space and resources to do that work. Um, <clears throat> I might have missed something earlier because I came late because I'm I'm not feeling good today. Um, and uh, so I don't know if I missed an update on the Office of Health Equity. I think I heard Susanna Davis say that someone was contracted to look at um, moving forward with the plan to open it up. But if if it was said already and you tell me that, I'll go back and watch the tape. But if it hasn't been said already, could you maybe take a minute to just explain kind of what we're, what we're looking at with that RFP and like, you know, what the plan is? I have um, two, uh, one other question too I'll ask and then I'll let um, Susanna and Mark kind of decide how to answer. The, the second one is that um, considering that um, we're, in the process right now of fine tuning the budget, the budget for 23, um, I am curious if either of you have any initial recommendations about areas where money should be spent right now. And I don't know if this is out of bounds, but like the healthcare committee has been looking at our recommendations. I would, at least as an individual, I would be interested in having you or a subgroup of the commission look at what we're thinking and give us some quick feedback. Um, I don't know if there's a formal way to do that and have the committee, you know, have people come in and testify, but I think there's little ways we can engage with the commission um, even before you're totally up and running. And one might be to see if there's a way you could look at what we're, we're doing and just give us some feedback before we you know, finish our budget recommendations, for example. So I guess that question is sort of any ideas where money should be spent right now. And um, what I did hear from Mark is the, talking about the social determinants of health, but I'm just curious if there's any more detail. So I know that was a lot, but I think the two main questions are where are we at with the Office of Health Equity and are there opportunities for you to shape our decisions as we make the budget by giving feedback and recommendations? So let me just comment. Uh, thank you for your questions. It's 10 o'clock. We're going to go a couple minutes over and then uh, Senator Hardy will have a question. And after that, we're going to end. Um, I, am I, I think as you're answering the question, please answer whether or not you are working with the House Human Services uh, Committee because they are also looking at social determinants. Just a thought there. But Senator, uh, oh, no, not yet, Senator. Uh, Go ahead, Susanna. Thank you. So the first question about where we are with the Office of Health Equity, the appropriated funds to hire the, the contractor have not been used yet. We, I chose not to do that um, because it, while we were still setting up the commission, it basically just would have been me making that decision by myself and I didn't feel comfortable making that decision on behalf of a 29 member group that had barely been impaneled yet. So I did not do that um, because I, again, process equity. So the answer is we are not anywhere with that. Um, I think that it has taken this commission longer than expected to find itself and get its sea legs. And I also simultaneously believe that we are exactly where we need to be. So, um, so that's, that's, that's where we are. We also do have, to the second point about budget, we have a sub committee on grants and funding that has a number of people in state government and outside of state government who are familiar with RFPs, contracting processes, and the landscape of what exists. For example, one of the members on that subcommittee is somebody who works at the health department who is in charge of managing at least one, possibly more federal grant programs and CDC funded grants as well. So we do have a good picture of the landscape of what opportunities there are in the health funding landscape and also what to look for in this kind of an RFP. So we're looking for that group probably to lead on that. And to your point, Representative Tina, about whether there's an opportunity to jointly look at some of the recommendations from these committees. Uh, I think that would be entirely appropriate and appreciated by the commission. And I'm sure that we can figure out a formal or an informal way to, to funnel that information back and forth. I also want to apologize very deeply to this group. Um, they are calling for me in Senate Natural, and um, I, I do need to step out, so I apologize for that. Well, we're very supportive of the work that's going on in Senate Natural, so good luck. And thank you for being here and uh, for bringing mm -hmm. us the information. We really do appreciate it very much. Thank you, and I do see that Senator Hardy does have a question. I apologize for not being able to stay and hear it, but of course, I'm available if you wanted to follow up by email afterwards. I'm happy to speak more. 
Senator Hardy, go ahead and ask your question and then uh, we can decide how to proceed. Go ahead. Well, if Director Davis needs to go, that that's fine. I will ask my question, but I can follow up with you um, also. Um, so go ahead if you need to, I, I don't wanna hold you up. Um, um, but thank you for your work also. Um, uh, yeah, so just thank you to Director Davis and Reverend Hughes and others who've worked on this. I think that we all knew when we were setting up this commission and doing the bill last year that it was a huge lift and a lot of work to do in a really fast time. Um, but I, I, mostly what I wanna just say, because I, I heard um, Mark say something that I think is contradictory to what I've heard in the past from Mark. So I, I just want to just sort of lay out this confusion I have, and I think it's worth a longer conversation. So I don't wanna have that necessarily now, but um, you said, please, I wrote it down, please do the work now and don't wait for us. And um, <laughs> that is incredibly contradictory to what I've heard from you in the past. And I understand what you mean, but I also think we need to be really careful um, you know, the whole uh, uh, not about us without us. Um, I, I'm really just conscious that we don't do anything that uh, gets in the way of the work. And as Representative China knows very well, he and I worked very closely at the end of last session to try to get all the language just right and the dates just right, and to make sure there was a timeline in there that spoke to the urgency of this work. So while I'm completely understanding and uh, appreciative of the fact that it's super complicated and you need a lot more time to really work through it with such a big group and and such a huge topic. I just wanna make sure that we are, uh, our urgency and your urgency and our need for time and your need for time doesn't get confused and that we are making sure that we're all working with best intentions and and so I just wanted to, that for me was kind of an elephant in the room. And I just want to say it out loud and know that this means we have to have a lot more conversations. Senator, Senator, uh, let, me, let me just say that that is exactly what I meant by business as usual where the legislature takes off mm -hmm. and it's catch as catch can rather than being built into a broader context. And so it's Great question. Go ahead, Reverend Hughes. Yeah, just a brief response to that, because I, I appreciate you sticking around for a couple more minutes, is, is, is that, you know, actually there, there is no contradiction um, because there's there's always been work that the legislature could move ahead on that they've been reluctant to. And it I think if there's any if there's ever really been much contradiction from our perspective, is is that there's a sense of urgency with uh, folks who own political and economic power in in times when they feel it's important but when folks who are in marginalized communities believe that there should be a sense of urgency then that's when folks with political and economic power usually have a tendency to put the brakes on and i think contextually that comment that was made just for clarity it had to do with those things that we know that we know that we must do. For, in the example, the specific example that I used was this data infrastructure, for example. So the question that we might ask ourselves just to completely round this conversation out is, is why is it that in uh, 2021, the, why is that the first time that we've ever decided that there was even a need for health equity? Why did we wait until 2021 to even make that decision? First of all, and then here's the second question. Why was it such an emergency that we have that report within two months after that or whatever that time frame was? And I think what that does is it really clearly points out the contrast in who set the priorities and when. Um, I think, you know, just to conclude on that and conclude with, with you today, unless there's uh, uh, any other questions, is, is that there are many things that are happening. Like, for example, H273 was on the wall uh, last year, and we're finally making some progress on it, but why is it that it take, it's taking us so long to move that? And why is it that we're uh, still trying to, you know, play a uh, hot potato with H406, uh, which is the economic development policy uh, regarding, um, you know, uh, economic equity for, for black and brown and other folk. So there are a number of, you know, again, contextually the whole upstream in all of the activities that are happening in other some of these communities upon which you serve, which is why I believed it was proper for me to state that just so we can get beyond a health um, conversation because wellness, as, as you know, it spreads broadly, is, is that there are things on the wall or things that have been in deliberation that have come forward 
from us and other organizations that you are currently deliberating that there doesn't seem to be a sense of urgency on. Um, and I would like to see, you know, I, you know, I, my hope is, is that as we do our work as a, as a um, HEAC, as a Health Equity Advisory Commission, those things that we've already established to you as priorities or those things that you already know to be priorities, um, I would just think that, you know, we, I would hope that you would continue to move forward on. So as much as I appreciate uh, Senator Hardy, uh, the clarification that you saw and I hopefully provide it, I think that, <clears throat> you know, I, I think we, we want to just be careful of a slippery slope of making assumptions that black and brown folks don't want you to do anything until we tell you to do uh, what we'd like you to do is, is we'd like you to do what you know or you must. Thank you. And with that, we need to ask our visitors uh, to leave this room. The Senate Health and Wel Welfare Committee will stay here for a brief time. And thank you so much, uh, Mark Hughes. Uh, and uh, please give our best again to Susanna and Andrea. This has been a very informative session and uh, very helpful. Thank so, you for having me, Madam Chair, and, and also I, I thank the, the committee, the joint, the full joint committee, and uh, please uh, feel free to follow back up with the other members directly if, if necessary, as well as myself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All thank right. You very so much. we end the joint committee meeting.